to your university and and um, uh, present in person, but um, I, I need to self-isolate, so that's not going to work out. Anyway, um, I hope I hope um, this um, this can nevertheless be uh, an, an interesting discussion presentation, uh, and I'd be very happy to to see if it generates any thinking or any questions um, after my presentations that we uh, we can subsequently this discuss. But let me um, let me share my screen um, and start the presentation that all works perfect uh if you put it to the presentation mode yep is that okay wonderful yeah yes okay so um i've, I've been working for much of the past 30 years mostly in indonesia i started off as, as a master's student um working on um on a variety of um tropical ecology type subjects and and ever since i've sort of been in the interface between ecological and conservation science and its implementation in um, in practice uh, i run a small company called uh, borneo futures in uh, in brunei where i'm normally based where we use scientific research to inform to inform uh, policy making uh, public opinion we do a lot of communication work uh, about the general management and sustainable management of natural resources and more specifically uh, biological research uh, resources um, in terms of wildlife conservation. Um, currently in Prague, I've been here since, um, <clears throat> since October, very much enjoy being in this country. Um, I, I, I'm pretty convinced Prague must be the most beautiful city on earth, but I haven't been to your city yet, so I can't, I can't judge that. So I'll, uh, I'll have to make that visit uh, next time I'm, uh, I'm around. Okay, uh, let me get started. So as I said, I, um, I started up as a student working on, on typical sort of um, tropical ecology type questions, uh, but quickly became interested. I was based in a national park in, um, in East Java, Indonesia for, for over a year and a half, and I became interested in the management aspects. It's all nice to study these things, but what if they are disappearing whilst we're studying the, the, the species that we're interested in? What are we going to do about it? So I um, I started looking more into the conservation aspects, the conservation management, um, the ecological side of that, as well as the political and social side of that. And ever since, I've sort of been moving back and forth. I feel very much like a scientist, but I've always got a, a firm sort of foot in the ground and trying to understand what the science that we're working on can actually mean for for practice, conservation practices but also um, thinking, public opinion, and so on. And um, one of the things I've learned about the field that I'm operating in, uh, wildlife conservation or biodiversity conservation, is that it's, it's just incredibly complicated. Um, you, you've probably heard this, um, this phrase being used uh, that something isn't, isn't rocket science, uh, as if rocket science is the most complicated and complex thing there is. And, I've made this little table to, um, to make the point that conservation science is actually far more difficult than, than rocket science. I mean, rocket science, of course, uh, at some stage, maybe in the 1950s or 60s, when the first rockets went into space, um, and we were really at the cutting edge of science, trying to understand the mechanisms, the, um, the, the electronics, the, the, the building and construction around it, then it was complicated. But ever since we, um, we've managed or um, experts have managed to, to work with rocket science because the mechanics are predictable, because the system that you're working on is a defined system. You want to send a rocket from, from Earth to the moon or to, to launch a satellite. You know the system in which you're operating. And that system has relatively few uncertainties. You, you tighten all your screws and uh, pretty much things should be okay. And therefore, understandably, there is a high success rate. Most rockets that are being launched into space these days um, do what they're supposed to do with the occasional failure. So rocket science is indeed complex compli and complicated, but ultimately it's solvable. Now with conservation science, I think we, we run into far bigger problems. Uh, quite often we don't understand any of the mechanisms. I mean, there is, of course, simply the the wildlife and the ecological side of conservation, but quite often that plays a really small role in the overall conservation context because we're dealing with, of course, people, we're dealing with land use, we're dealing with 
uh, habitats, we're dealing with underlying geology, but we're also dealing with, with um, um, economics, we're dealing with politics, um, uh, social issues, anthropological issues, and so on. So you have all these kind of interreacting forces that create the system in which we operate. And quite often we don't know what the boundaries are of the system. Let's say I work in, in orangutan conservation. Uh, am I working for the conservation of that orangutan or that orangutan in that particular bit of forest with the ecology of the forest around it? Or is that orangutan population part of a larger meta population connected to other populations? Or is it part of a social ecological system that also has people that try to farm in that forest or earn a living from that forest? So there is no fixed sort of boundary around the system and the system boundary is really what we determine ourselves. Um, there's also high uncertainty as opposed to rocket science, uh, a lot of non-linear in interactions where a very small change, let's say a political decision about something completely changes the outcome in a non-linear fashion uh, that is pretty much unpredictable. We don't know what that small change is going to uh, mean further down the line. Um, it deals with wicked problems and wicked problems are, are basically problems that you'll, you'll never be able to answer. You don't even quite know what the problem is. Also, as you are trying to define the problem and trying to find the answers to the problem, you're changing the initial problem setting and uh, it's a, a runaway thing that you never come to a clear answer with. And I think conservation science is very much characterized by those kind of um, problem settings. Um, for that reason, I think we also have quite a, a low success rate where I operate in the um, uh, Southeast Asian tropics. Um, most of the, the species we've wor we're working on are uh, in rapid decline, even though we've worked on them for, for many decades. So clearly we don't quite get it right. So Conservation science is, is like rocket science, it's complex, it's also complicated, but it may actually be unsolvable. And that's, that's quite something um, to, to keep in mind as we're working in, uh, in these fields. And um, I, I love this quote um, by, by Henry Louis Mencken that kind of characterizes what people tend to do when the, um, the, the problems are, um, are such that they, they can't be surmounted. He said that for, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. Um, and I think that characterizes is we, we're dealing with these very complex contexts where we just don't understand what to do. And we just jump at something like a simple solution. Uh, an example from orangutan conservation is the very strong focus currently on uh, rescue and orangutans, translocating them, uh, rehabilitating them, reintroducing them, which is kind of the public face that a lot of people have, these, these lovely orangutan babies in a wheelbarrow of orangutan conservation. Um, the more we look into these kind of situations or these kind of solutions, we realize that um, they, they're not really helping conservation. Uh, and in fact, maybe undermining conservation, uh, something I will explain further down the line. So quite often the, the simple um, feel good answer to a complex problem turns out to be not particularly useful or even quite pro problematic. And um, that's why it becomes really important to think hard about these complex, complex contexts in which we, uh, we operate. Um, I heard that you all have a, sort of a background working in Southeast Asia or in uh, Oceania. So you probably know a little bit about the background, but just briefly, um, the species that I'm talking about, the orangutan, um, are actually three species, the Bornean, Sumatran, and um, <clears throat> Tapanuli orangutan. The Tapanuli is, is quite a recent discovery. The, the paper we published on that was only published in, um, in 2017, so about five years ago, um, where we... Um, after the rediscovery of that species in, um, um, in 1997. Um, so that's, that's really quite, quite recent. And subsequently finding out that both morphologically, behaviorally, as well as genetically, this is a really distinct lineage of uh, orangutan that may, uh, may actually be more closely related to the Bornean orangutan, but certainly has a time depth of uh, over 3 million years of, of independence 
uh, evolution. So currently three, um, uh, three orangutans distributed um, on the islands of Sumatra and Borneo. You can see that in the, uh, in the map with the, the different subspecies colored in, uh, in different colors. Um, but something I'll discuss later that this is really only a small part of what used to be the distribution range of the orangutan. And it's really important that we see this bigger picture. But let me talk about that um, slightly further down the line. Um, all of the three species of orangutan are what is called, uh, according to the IUCN, red list for threatened species, uh, um, characterized or identified as critically endangered. Now, the IUCN, uh, which is the largest uh, conservation organization in the world, a conservation network, uh, Katka already mentioned that I work a lot with the IUCN. It's all kind of volunteer work where you provide input on the basis of the species that you know on, for example, assessing the, the, the conservation status of species or working on conservation strategies and providing input. Um, for example, I also chair the IUCN Oil Crops Task Force, which is a, ta which is a task force that looks at um, uh, palm oil and soybean and rapeseed and sunflower and all the big oil crops and tries to understand them in terms of um, um, sustainable development and social and environmental impacts and so on. So that's, that's kind of the IUCN. Um, all three species, as I said, have been identified as critically endangered, which is based on, in the case of Pongo pygmaeus, which is the Bornean orangutan, um, that code um, CRA4, a, B, C, D, which is um, in the text then a reduction in population size based on um, uh, an observed, estimated, inferred, predicted, or suspe suspected population size of more than 80% based on uh, any of those uh, four uh, criteria, direct observation and index of abundance. So basically, these species are in rapid decline and are also expected to remain in um, rapid decline unless we change something about the way we, um, we manage the threats to them, really. Um, one, of this, one of the problems in this um, discussion around declines is that you need to actually be able to determine the population size. And you think, well, that, that'd be pretty straightforward. So, um, orangutans are large arboreal apes. I mean, they're red. So you, how could you miss one? but they sort of occur at quite low densities. A good orangutan density would be maybe one to two animals per square kilometer, three in exceptional um, circumstances. A square kilometer of tropical rainforest is a pretty large area to survey. So what we traditionally do is not to look for orangutans, but to look for indirect signs of orangutans. And that's mostly uh, looking for orangutans every, every night normally, they make like a sleeping platform uh, where they break off branches and put leaves on it. And so they can sleep comfortably up in a tree. And those nests are, uh, they, they stay around for a certain amount of time. And they, if you count the nests rather than the orangutans, you have a much higher encounter rate and therefore a statistically more robust way of finding an indirect indication of the density of orangutans. Now, that method has a lot of problems. Um, I mentioned decay rates. Um, 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 these nests, they stay around for a certain number of time, but of course, because they're, they're made of wood and leaves, it really depends on a lot of factors how long they will stay around. And you need to know that to be able to compensate in your translation from nest density to orangutan density, what that decay rate is. Uh, and we've done studies on that, and that can vary by a factor 10 uh, from well, maybe not quite 10, but from as quick as 80 days, yeah, to about 800 days. So a factor 10, and that, that is directly proportional with your uh, orangutan density rate. So if you apply the wrong decay rate to your, your calculation, you end up with a very wrong population or density estimates. And therefore, once you start extrapolating your density estimates to your uh, distribution area, uh, you're introducing a big error or a big mistake. Now, um, the graph here shows how even experts have struggled providing um, uh, population estimates for, for Borneo orangutan. 
Um, uh, the table there um, shows the first population estimates that was for the whole of Borneo between 1,000 and 4,000 animals. Um, and that includes people like uh, George Schaller, who is uh, a famous uh, wildlife biologist who really does know and did know about wildlife um, distribution and ecology. So he thought that on the whole of Borneo in the 1960s, there were a maximum of 4,000 orangutans left. Um, subsequently to that, um, Herman Reichsen, John McKinnon, uh, myself and Herman Reichsen made estimates for the total population. And those, those are in the graphs shown in these, these black bars, the vertical bars that, that show the large variation over time. And subsequently to that, in these two papers here on the right by uh, Maria Voigt and uh, Truly Santika et al., um, we, we have a much better understanding of um, the, the likely population trend, which if we back, back cast them into time to the 1960s, indicate that when George Scheller thought there were about 4,000 orangutans, there probably were about 300,000 orangutans. Um, so about um, um, 100 times <coughs> more, uh, which, is, which is quite surprising. And you think that ultimately we get better at this, but I'm, I'm just working on a study where I'm trying to, to work out what the current population size is from expert estimates. We cannot really model it. One of the problems with orangutan conservation or orangutan distribution modeling is that, um, of course, the density of the species depends on, on the forest and the forest type. Orangutans are forest species. Um, the better, the, the higher the carrying capacity of a forest is, the higher the density could be. Orangutans are frugivore, so if you have a great number of, for example, um, fig trees in your forest, generally the density is higher. So that's the ecological side of it. But orangutans are also very much hunted by, by people and have been for, for many thousand years. So there's large parts of the distribution range of the orangutan that has um, what we could look at as suitable habitats, but almost no orangutan. So ecology doesn't tell you the full, the full story. Social history tells a lot of it. And the social history is one of those things that we do not know. Um, so coming back to the graph here, it shows um, um, uh, some, some estimates recently made by uh, 17 independent orangutan distribution experts that I asked, what is the current population size now? We all have the same information. We know the size of the distribution range. We know the range of densities, but apparently the unknowns, the known unknowns, uh, for example, the role of historic hunting on today's density, but also the unknown unknowns, like stuff we simply don't know, we should know, um, like, like were there past disease outbreaks in orangutans like you have with Ebola and gorillas that have uh, emptied out entire areas that are ecologically suitable, but no orangutans occur. So um, taking all that in mind, it means that even the people, the, the experts have uh, a large sort of range of, of estimates around the, the mean uh, that, that really shows that even today, after 50 years of orangutan surveys, we still do not really know how many there are, which is a little bit of a concern because that also means that we know very little about uh, population trends. Um, just to, to dig a little deeper in that, um, I, I think the focus for species like orangutans and maybe a lot of species that you're working on yourself is we tend to view these species from an ecological angle. Um, um, an orangutan is a great ape. It's primarily a frugivore. It's, it has a big body mass um, to be able to cope with, with long periods of low food availability and therefore fall back on its fat reserves. Um, really suitably adapted to the, um, the, the fruiting cycles of, of Southeast Asian forests. And, don't forget, of course, now they are limited in distribution to only the islands of Borneo and Sumatra, but they used to occur on Java, uh, the Malay Peninsula, they used to occur in what is now Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, even into Southern China. So the entire area of Southeast Asia once had orangutans. So 
all the ecological conditions there are also represented in the ecology of the orangutan. So it's an adaptable species that is generally arboreal. We call it the solitary ape because it's generally compared to the, uh, the more gregarious gorillas and bonobos and chimpanzees. Um, it tends to hang out by itself, females with their young, uh, males by themselves in sort of a, a, an open distributed um, um, social structure uh, with a density, as I said, maybe one, two animals per square kilometer. Uh, we tend to see them from, from many studies that people have conducted in mostly protected areas as ecologically very sensitive species that really depend on primary forests for their survival. Um, we, we know that they are tool users, there's been descriptions of culture in orangutan, they're intelligent, and so on. That, 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 that's the sort of ecological angle which is nicely captured here in this National Geographic um, drawing of the orangutan in its forest habitat. Um, that's part of the view. The other view is the, the anthropogenic angle or the, the human angle, uh, because orangutans have evolved over millions of years in Southeast Asia, and only about um, 80,000, maybe 19,000 years, modern humans walk into that area. And um, my assumption is that um, they came across the orangutan and thought, well, that's a nice tasty piece of big meat that is quite slow and easy, easily huntable. So um, we, we, we of course don't know, but we do know that orangutans are highly represented in the uh, early, middle and late Pleistocene fossil record for Southeast Asia. On the maps, all the numbered um, circles are fossil sites where orangutan, orangutans, orangutans have been found, often in quite large amounts. Um, surprisingly, considering how rare orangutans are now in the fossil record, they're quite often the, the second or third most common species um, in terms of remains after pigs and deer. And pigs and deer currently, of course, are of course uh, much more common and abundant than, than orangutans. So there's something something unusual there. My, my view on this is that when modern humans with, with primitive hunting tools walked into initially into the distribution range of the orangutan, they started having quite a big impact. And um, you see that by the time the, the Holocene comes, um, orangutans have disappeared from uh, a huge area of historic or prehistoric distribution range where they then no longer occurred, including that entire stretch of, of mainland Southeast Asia, all the way down into the Malay Peninsula, but also from very large parts of the island of Sumatra. Java, they were, they were gone, and we don't quite know when that happened. I think that could potentially be quite recent, like maybe, maybe a thousand years ago or so. But also from Borneo, they are missing from large parts of the island where even now there is beautiful forests that are ecologically so, suitable for orangutans. So orangutans currently live in about 5% of their original distribution range. And the question that concerns me or the question that I think about is that an ecological thing because of the changes that occur during the Pleistocene to the habitat and the ability of the orangutan to survive? Or is that a human question? And it's important for me because that answers a lot of things that are relevant to uh, to conservation management. Um, now to investigate this environmental impact hypothesis is basically the question, um, as during the Pleistocene, of, of course you get these, these subsequent ice ages coming and going, and during the ice ages, even in the Southeast Asian subtropics and tropics, you switch from dense tropical, wet tropical forest to more open forest type, or even light forest types, or even wooded savanna. So we've looked at that. Um, at the top in this, this, this graph here are three national parks, Kutai, Gunung Palung, and Gunung Loser, where orangutans currently occur um, that are heavily forested. And that's why we have the association of orangutans and dense tropical forests. However, if you look back in time, a lot of these um, fossil sites 
Naya Cave on Borneo, a lot of sites in Laos, on Java, uh, in, 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 on Sumatra, in China, uh, in Vietnam. Had a combination of heavy forests, but also quite moderate and light forest conditions during which orangutans occurred, which is interesting. So we know orangutans occurred in these areas at a time when they were not, not necessar necessarily covered in dense forests, which would lead to the conclusions that orangutans do not necessarily need these dense forest conditions. Um, although uh, it's an indication, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a certainty. So the environmental impact hypotheses, uh, we certainly know that orangutans stayed around at a time when a lot of these sites, um, such, such as the sites here, Tumwima and Nakin, um, didn't have um, heavy forest cover anymore. So orangutans were able to persist in more open forest types. Um, this is a paper, by the way, we published uh, in 2018 in, in Science Advances, if you, if you want to read more. The same, this graph is also from that same paper where we, we looked at the, co, um, the, the coincidence of orangutan occurrence, uh, forest cover in these areas of Borneo, Sumatra, Java, and the mainland Asia, arrival of modern humans, um, development of um, effective um, hunting weapons like uh, spare points and, and bow and arrow, um, forest clearing, and it sort of starts to give us a bit of an understanding that, um, at least from what I see in the data, probably the arrival of people had a bigger impact on the disappearance of orangutan than the changes that were occurring in the forest because of climate, um, climate change. There's probably a bit of a mix there of both the human and environmental impact hypotheses, but my gut feeling is that people played a bigger role. And, um, that's also shown in more recent times. This is a paper I published, um, I can't actually remember, um, anyway, a few years back in the plus one, where we looked at um, declining encounter rates over the past 170 years or so. I looked at the, um, the many expeditions. Actually, let me, let me take a step back here. Um, I don't know, a lot, of you, a lot of you probably have read the Malay Archipelago by Alfred Russell Wallace, and you're probably familiar of his descriptions of um, orangutan hunting or killing and collecting in Sarawak, where he had his collection team and he used to, um, um, they used to, to go out and, and look for, for wildlife, including orangutans. And they, they would, it's all written down in his diary in the book. And they used to call him over and say, uh, oh, Mr. Wallace, come over. There is in that tree, there's like five orangutans. And he would go get his gun and shoot five orangutans. And, and then like, like 10 minutes later, oh, there's another tree, there's another six orangutans. And he would go and shoot another six orangutans. He's sort of reading that and think, well, he's just seen 11 orangutans in a really small area of forest or a small area in the forest where, where he was, indicating an exceptionally high congregation of orangutans uh, at that time. So that made me think like, okay, is there more information in these older sources, um, diaries and collection diaries and so on? And we did that and I, I quantified a lot of these encounter rates with orangutans and killing rates of orangutans, controlling for the size of these teams. Of course, if you're by yourself in the forest, the likelihood of you seeing an orangutan may be much smaller than if you have 20 people looking, looking for orangutans for yourself. But controlling for all of that, we, we see a quite strong decline uh, and st statistically significant decline, even over the past 150 years, where the, the likelihood of encountering orangutan uh, declined sixfold. Um, and whether that also, also means that the density um, has declined sixfold, I don't quite know. Um, but it probably indicates that even, and, and these are areas that were forested in, in the 1850s and 18 and 1900s, but are still forested now. So we're not talking here about deforestation. We're not talking here about forest degradation, but we're simply talking about orangutan density, density declining in good quality forest, presumably as um, a result of, of unsustainable takeoff rates. And, and even over historic times, that is quite significant. Um, 
which, which leads to the very interesting question if orangutan densities have been declining um, because of human interference, what, what is actually an, a, a normal natural orangutan density? We, we always tend to think that ecology controls density uh, and that most populations live at carrying capacity, um, but maybe, maybe they don't. Maybe orangutan, what we now consider a good density of one or two animals per square kilometer, maybe 10 animals per square kilometer uh, was quite normal for orangutans, but you complete, you, this is a photo from a, um, uh, one of these release islands in, in Kalimantan, where um, I think there's about, if you count them carefully, about five orangutans in, in one tree, uh, of, of course, under artificial uh, circumstances, because these are, these, these receive super supplementary feeding. Um, but maybe this is a more normal, um, kind of density for orangutans. And that changes a lot that we know about orangutans. So the solitary ape um, is based on that dispersed distribution with, with, with females and young and males controlling a number of females. But you increase the density, everything is changing, your social behavior, your reproductive behavior, your feeding behavior. So there's a lot of questions that are raised for me, like what, what, how natural is the orangutan, today's orangutan, compared to what it was uh, 80 or 100,000 years ago when modern humans first walked into the distribution range of the orangutan. So indeed, maybe the species is less natural, whatever that means, um, than we, we think. Uh, this idea of a solitary, low density, or boreal, highly sensitive species, where the, th the main threat is the loss of primary forest, um, is just not supported by data. Uh, terrestrial behavior, for example, all the original ecological and behavioral studies of orangutans never mentioned terrestrial behavior. It, it just wasn't seen. And the, the assumption was therefore orangutans 100% arboreal. And of course their morphology and the way they're, they have evolved are, they are an arboreal uh, brachiating species. But the funny thing is as soon as people started putting camera traps on the ground, there's huge amounts of terrestrial behavior in orangutans. They, they do, just don't want to come to the ground if you are there and look at them because probably they know people are a threat and you don't want to be on the ground when there's people on the ground because you tend to die then. So a lot of these assumptions made about behavior are also related to observ uh, observational biases. Now this idea that orangutans are highly sensitive and the, the smallest change in their primary forest habitat is going to upset them to the point that we that, that they will disappear. There was still common thinking uh, up until like 2000, until we started studying orangutans in, in selectively low timber concessions. And it turned out they actually really quite like that because uh, Bornean forests especially, the, the main sort of three species are diptrocarp species, orangutans, that those are the timber species. Orangutans don't normally feed on those trees. So once timber concessions take them out, you get uh, regrowth of, of pioneer species that orangutans quite, uh, quite like. So they do quite well in timber concessions as long as they're not hunted. Um, they, they actually survive not so much in, in oil palm as such, but they survive in fragmented landscapes with oil palm and forest fragments over decades. I mean, there's, there's breeding females in these oil palm landscapes that have been studied and whether that's a viable population and a viable population context is a little bit unclear still, but they are, they are quite resilient. Um, so I think this idea of the orangutan being highly sensitive and they can't deal with anything is, is just not true. I think orangutans are really quite resilient, which is important for conservation um, thinking. Um, because if your species, your focal species is super sensitive, you just need to set aside the forest and leave it alone. If your species is quite resilient, it opens up opportunities for different types of, um, of management. Sorry, just have a sip of water. <clears throat> it also, um, uh, it's also opens up uh, thinking around this concept, which I really quite like of a refugee species, which is 
um, their species defined as uh, species that can no longer access optimal habitats, but are confined to suboptimal habitats. And um, quite often species, and here is a list of different examples, are only being studied in that suboptimal habitat because we assume that that's their optimal habitat. And we've never seen them in their optimal habitat because, because they've either been hunted out or the habitat has disappeared. Um, and a lot of species that we're looking at are probably these kind of refugee species, including the, the orangutan. And I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll make that clear with, um, with one of those three species of the orangutan, the Tapanuli orangutan. Uh, this is a paper we published last year in, uh, in PLOS One. Uh, you look at the map here, you see the, the pink uh, distribution range. That is the current range of Pongo tapanuliensis, the Tapanuli orangutan. And that's kind of where, when that population was initially discovered in 1997, um, where our thinking is focused. This is a, a highland area and orangutans there, the Tapanuli orangutan, lives much higher than both the Bornean and the Sumatran orangutan. So it's very unusual. It's, it feeds on a number of tree species no other lowland orangutan species would feed on. Um, it, um, it has certain behaviors that seem to be adapted to these high altitude conditions. And the thinking started to develop that this is, this is really like a, a mountain orangutan and a hill orangutan, maybe similar to the mountain gorilla where it has evolved in situ and developed these behavioral adaptations specifically to cope with uh, high altitude habitats, which is a really interesting idea. But then we, we started to, to map the historic range of the orangutan uh, based on, on previously unknown information hidden in uh, colonial era newspapers and old books. And I spent years looking for, I like, I like sort of digging through the old information because it, it teaches you so much about context. And, I found a whole bunch of old records working with, with, uh, with colleagues that showed that um, um, what we now think of the current range of the, the Tapanuli orangutan is probably only about two and a half percent of the range it had um, in the 1890s, uh, so 130 years ago, which is here on the, the, the central map on the right. Uh, so a vastly larger area of habitat most of which was lowland habitat. So this idea that the Tapanuli orangutan is a ecologically specialized highland species is probably total nonsense. Um, and it, it used to be distributed across vastly larger areas of lowland forest where it disappeared. Now the forest is still there even today. So my best guess is that they were hunted out of those areas. Um, and then through a combination of, of um, of, of unsustainable hunting pressure and habitat fragmentation. So orangutans, they don't easily move. They don't cross rivers, they don't swim. So once they're gone from a for forest area, they don't easily repopulate those, um, those areas, especially if your females are gone. Males tend to travel more, females don't really travel. So orangutans are almost one directional. If they're gone from an area, it's extremely hard for them to repopulate that particular area. Uh, it's an ecological dead end in that in that sense. Um, again, this is important for for management because if we think of this orangutan being a specialized highland orangutan, we can just safely protect its highland habitat. But if this is a refugee species that would would much rather be in a lowland forest, we're dealing with very suboptimal conditions in its current habitat that may mean that its extinction is even more rapid than we think. Uh, there's only 800 Tapanuli orangutans left in the world. It's the, the most endangered great ape species and it's not even living in a suitable area. So that's a real uh, um, amount of concern. Um, all this is, is, is leading to different thinking about uh, management. Um, so the traditional way people think about orangutans, this, this solitary ape of, of primary forest, um, people jump to simple conclusions. Oil palm is the biggest destroyer of forests, so it's the biggest threat. Uh, you just need to protect the forest and the orangutan will be fine. Um, because they need large forest areas and they're very sensitive ecologically, they will, will not survive in small forest fragments. 
and therefore we need to rescue them and translocate them into larger forest areas. Uh, peat swamp and hilly areas, because that's where we see the orangutan densities are higher, are the best orangutan habitats. Um, or are they? Are they, and I'll come back to that later. Um, so the thinking is from that on the left-hand side of this graph, if you keep people and orangutan separated and you protect the habitats uh, in large enough areas, orangutans will be pretty much fine. Um, my way of thinking more and more is that the biggest threat to orangutan is killing and has ever been the biggest threat. Um, orangutans are very slowly reproducing um, um, species with a very low reproductive uh, rate that has to do with the fact of their inter birth interval being seven, eight, nine years. So the female and the young stay together for, for very long periods before she will have another young. So one female killed, uh, basically if out of a population of a hundred animals, you take out one every year, that population will go extinct. Um, it just doesn't have the breeding capacity, the reproductive ability to recover from those kind of offtake rates. So I think killing is a, a key driver of orangutan decline. Uh, luckily, I think they're ecologically quite robust and versatile. They do survive in forest fragments, even, even as small as, as like 100 hectares, 200 hectares, which in any sort of thinking about population dynamics would be considered unviable. They're not, they're surviving in these areas, they're breeding in these areas. Uh, and therefore, I think it's important that they also manage in situ. Uh, translocating them out of these fragments leads to high mortality rates, but also undermines the metapopulation dynamics of, of all these connected fragments. Uh, the idea that orangutans belong in peat swamp and hilly areas, I think may be more to do with the fact that these are areas that were not hunted because they're really unpleasant. Uh, for humans and there is no agriculture possible, uh, rather than the fact that these are ecologically the best places for, for orangutan. So my idea on what this all means for conservation management is that um, all forests need to be managed, all forest fragments need to be managed, otherwise they disappear. And we really need to look for solutions in which people and orangutans coexist, which is a completely different way of looking at, um, at conservation. I think I'm going a little slower, so I'm, I'm going to skip this one on why wild-to-wild -wild translocations are not a good idea. Uh, there's a paper coming out. If you're interested, just, just send me an email and I can talk you through, um, through this. Um, these forest fragments is something we're focusing a lot because they're kind of embedded in agricultural landscapes and there's a lot of orangutans out there. There's up to 10,000 orangutans, so that's that's probably more than 10% of the total populations that don't live in big protected areas, but in these small forest fragments. And I think we need to do something there. You can't just all uh, let them die. We also know that translocation them, translocating them is not helping at all. It's probably um, undermining conservation efforts. And we've studied um, um, orangutan behavior in these patchy uh, fragmented landscapes. And we know that they're, they're certainly hanging in there. Um, paper we published last year in, in Frontiers in Forest and Global Change, where we compiled information on orangutans in these, these patches. Um, lots of forest patches where females and babies uh, persist over long periods of time. And, um, and males travel through, in this case, the oil palm landscape to visit females and, and maintain uh, um, um, genetic their gene flow through these landscapes. So we think it's really important that these kind of fragmented landscapes are protected as such, and we're looking for solutions that, um, that help support that. Um, we're currently doing more work on, on modeling uh, orangutan behavior in these fragmented landscapes. This was a paper that's already published last year where we look at different um, uh, connectivity uh, types between forest fragments and what it takes, what it means for uh, orangutan survival under different offtake uh, off rates. And again, you see that an offtake rate of, of zero, so no killing, uh, can lead to significant positive pop population change. Anything over 1% of the adult population, so any population where you take out more than one per year, is going to drive the population down very quickly. 
uh, this paper was published and um, you can look it up. I think it's a really well done paper that also looks at um, dispersal distances um, across different landscape configurations. Um, we don't really like this. People, this you probably heard this, um, this whole debate around orangutans and oil palm and, and we all hate oil palm because of its impact on orangutans. And, and to, to, to make sure orangutan, orangutans have to be badly affected by oil palm development, that's very clear. Um, so pictures like this of a male orangutan sitting in an oil palm tree, people think that that's just not right. Um, this, this, this merging of this wonderful iconic species with <coughs> this ugly palm destruction and what people sort of see in the, in the polarized debate around, um, around vegetable oils. Which is kind of funny because in the European context, we think merging agriculture and, and wildlife conservation is really quite acceptable. Um, I, I, I cut these, these uh, pictures out of a, a, a popular Dutch nature conservation magazine that shows in the bottom picture sort of our current agricultural system with um, uh, monocultures, uh, high levels of pesticides and herbicides and frequent mowing. So uh, ground nesting birds can never raise their young, uh, straight features, uh, low water level, um, and this, then this improved ecological landscape with more <clears throat> natural ecozones, uh, higher water table, more breeding opportunities, lower productivity, a smaller farm with more kind of mixed outcomes. To us, that's completely new, uh, 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 relevant thinking and sort of the, the next way forward in, in conservation. And it's, it's kind of funny that we, funny that we find this all great in, in, in Europe to think along those lines. Whereas in, in Asia, are really struggling to get conservation organizations to buy into uh, this idea of also looking at uh, the conservation of orangutans within an, over, um, an agricultural context. Um, <clears throat> this is a paper we're still working on, sort of showing the same, excuse me, Um, the same, it's, it's unpublished, but um, the same idea where we look at are these fragmented populations actually viable? And again, we find, yes, they are viable as long as you control killing, <coughs> which kind of feeds into all the analyses I've talked about in historic um, and prehistoric uh, context that probably killing is the biggest factor that we need to focus on if we want to maintain orangutan population. And of course, that, that, um, that touches on people. As I said, orangutan conservation is probably not about orangutans or even about, well, to a certain extent, it is about forests and forest management, but it's largely about, about people. And, and as conservation organizations, we're really, really bad at dealing with human context. We always talk about community-based conservation and changing the mindset of rural communities, but we're really not trained. We're most of us are from a background of ecology and, and 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 thinking about wildlife and a deep love for wildlife and interest in species. We know very little about people, diet people, um, their their what motivates them, what 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 annoys them. And <clears throat> this is a great paper um, with a group of anthropologists I've worked with for for several years that have looked at the anthropology of orangutan conservation and. They're finding some, some really interesting uh, views. I mean, this, this particular case of um, only the orangutans get a life jacket talks about a community experience where a, an orangutan sanctuary is going to release orangutans in the remote forest areas and, and the orangutans are in cages, they're put, being put on boats. All the cages have these life vests around them in case the cage, the boat capsizes and the cage falls in the water so the orangutans don't drown, um, but the people on the boat who can't swim don't get a life jacket. And I think that really captures a lot of the thinking I've heard from local people in places like Indonesian Borneo about orangutan conservation, where people say, well, hang on, um, like if my child is um, hungry or has got diarrhea, no one comes and feeds it milk and bananas and medicine, 
I just have to cope with myself. And look at these orangutan babies. They get all the help they want. So there's some strange and, and understandable thinking happening among communities that doesn't get them on our side in helping orangutan conservation. And I think we, we need to be so much more cognizant and understanding of the social context of the work that we, 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 um, we're operating in. Um, uh, yeah, an interesting paper to uh, to to look at to to see at some of the look at some of the human views on conservation. Um, I, I think this starts to wrap it up a little bit. Um, so we're dealing with these wicked conservation problems in complex contexts where people who care about orangutans, the the donors to conservation, they want clear answers to complex problems, uh, simple answers. And unfortunately, a lot of these simple answers are simply uh, wrong. Um, we, we have a paper, I think it should be out in a few months in current biology, where we've analyzed 20 years of conservation funding to orangutan conservation, both on Borneo and Sumatra. That amounts to about a billion dollars. So that's a lot of money invested on an annual basis. Well, this is over 20 years, so it's about 70 million, 67 million per year invested in orangutan conservation. Um, it's not like we didn't achieve anything. Um, we, we did lose about 100,000 orangutans over that time frame, but without conservation, we probably would have lost about 135,000 orangutans. So there is an impact from conservation, but it's also nowhere near good enough. Um, and my, my challenge or my... Um, commitment is to try to work out, well, what is going to work? What is it going to take to save a species like orangutans? And, and what's the context in which we need to, uh, to do that? And I think the way we go about um, conservation at the moment doesn't address these uh, problems effectively at all. And I'm pretty convinced that unless we change, orangutans will keep on rapidly declining, um, and I, I'm, I'm the last one to talk about extinction. I, I think both the governments of Indonesia and Malaysia are going to prevent the extinction of orangutans, whatever it takes. But wherever we, now, we are now in conservation estimates, uh, population estimates, uh, maybe there's 100,000 orangutans left. I still think over the next 10 years, we could easily lose another 50,000. Also because we, we've done subsequent work on killing rates and killing rates are still high in places like, uh, like Borneo. So uh, we need to focus on the key threats, hunting, deforestation, of course. I think forest fragmentation we can deal with. I really need, I really think we need to rethink uh, the current focus on rescues and, um, and, and reintroductions and translocations, especially translocations, wild to wild translocations. I think they're really problematic. Um, and I said, I'm happy to talk about that offline. Uh, if you want more detail. And we need to go to a situation that's, that, that addresses the orang these orangutans in their broader social ecological context of, of course, uh, protected areas, but also people that live there, um, uh, people that try to farm, companies that are farming, and so on. That, that, that is what is Borneo like, whether we like it or not. That's the reality. And within that reality, we somehow need to find a new balance in which um, unlike any time in the past, humans and orangutans can actually go exist. I really think it's possible. Um, no one needs to kill an orangutan. Uh, people are not hungry. They don't eat, need the meat. Uh, as far as I know, no one um, recognizes medicinal purposes in, in eating orangutans. Um, orangutans are not dangerous normally if you leave them alone. So you know, orangutans and people could rub shoulders quite easily. We just need to make some major changes in mindsets of ourselves, but also people on Borneo that, that will live there next to those orangutans. So yeah, complex uh, conservation is complex and simple answers uh, are rarely correct. And I think in, in any of the, con the, the context in which you're working, you probably find the same, um, the same patterns that, that simple answers simply don't work. Um, I think it's important to look at species evolution in, 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 in their historical context and really try to think the species that you're looking at, is this, is this really what that species was once, was once like? 
or is it there because of uh, many millennia of human interference? Um, we should consider that species ecology can change over time. I mentioned is the current orangutan the same as the orangutan 100,000 years ago? Well, I'm pretty sure it isn't, but maybe that's not a problem. Maybe the orangutan today needs to also adapt to the situations and context today. And finally, if we don't really think about enough about the conservation context, uh, we can get the conservation management really quite wrong. And at a time when we're losing species at a very rapid rate, I don't think we can afford being uh, wrong for much longer. So that wraps it up. I'd like to, uh, to thank you very much for your attention and be very happy to, um, to take any questions or discuss anything of what I've, uh, what I've talked about. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, it was re really, really nice. And I have got many questions. There are people clapping quietly. Uh, yes, <laughs> virtually. So I'm wondering whether there are some questions uh, first on in the audience. Just speak up, please. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for a nice uh, presentation. And I have one uh, quick uh, question, actually. Mm -hmm. I was quite uh, surprised by the decline in, let's say, encounter rates or probably density over times from volleys. And do you think, or to which extent, is there uh, the behavioral change of the orangutans? Because I could imagine that, like recently, they are more scared of hunters. They can be more hiding. Maybe this six-fold decline in densities, maybe let's say three times decline and uh, something in, in the behavior change. And because of good records since Volis, we might uh, be able to really re record how the behavior of, of the orangutans change. And if you have any insight into this. Yeah, so that uh, good question. Uh, and that, that's why I said uh, a six-fold decline in encounter rate does not necessarily mean a six-fold decline in density. So when, when Wallace would see five or six orangutans, um, I, I, I'm not an orangutan ecologist, so I haven't really, um, but I've seen, I've been in a lot of forests and I've seen a lot of orangutans, but I've never seen five in a tree or six. So indeed it might mean that orangutans have changed their behavior after having been, I mean, uh, effective shotguns um, come in, I don't exactly know when in Borneo, but maybe like, like 150 years ago, probably with the first Western hunters and collectors, and prior to that, it would have been the blowpipe. Of course, the blowpipe is a silent, uh, a silent uh, weapon. You, the orangutan sits in the tree and suddenly feels, um, feels a little pinprick and then feels sick and falls out of the tree and you're dead. There's not much learning opportunity, but a loud shotgun sound might, and then an orangutan falling out of a tree dead and another orangutan seeing that might indeed be a means to change behavior in the orangutan. Uh, and maybe one of the reasons they don't congregate. Congregation leads to higher detection rates, leads to greater, um, potentially greater mortality. So um, I, I don't have any insights beyond observation that it might occur, but um, maybe it's possible to tease it from historic data uh, and, and, and how, uh, I haven't delved, delved further into this, but it, um, it you might be able to find that from the historic literature, comparing it to current day, descriptions of uh, orangutan encounters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I could imagine that like they could uh, really be scared of people carrying the guns because they could learn like they're clever apes in this perspective. And I think it could be interesting. Even if, if nobody has studied before, it might be fruitful to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and the same, I guess, with terrestrial behavior. Um, orangutans are just not terrestrial when people are around, but they are terrestrial when people are not around, which uh, makes me think there might be a, a role of people there uh, in, in influencing that behavior. So there's, there's, um, it's not been studied. This it's, 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 an, it's an interesting area to to think about and what which ways you could use smartly to find data to substantiate different hypotheses about behavioral change as a as a result of um, of current and past hunting pressure. Interesting su subject. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.